The Lost Party. For reference, this group is Alexander, Yorin, Elena, Hubert, Gunnar, Orson, Ben Longshanks, Drengy, Miles, Quigley, Quickly, John, Tiny, and Brother Luke. Ben and Orson are badly injured. Alexander is carrying Luke's sword as the Kerensky blade is now little more than a broken hilt, and they are quickly trying to ascend a steep stair out of the lair of the Old Ones. The bat creatures streak down to attack them periodically. Given how high the stairs take them, one of their awkward lift-and-drop attacks could easily prove fatal. But the bats are cowed by the white light still radiating out of Yorin and Elena's holy pendants, and any of them that get adventurous are rewarded with one of Yorin's dwindling arrow supply. Or, if they get really lucky, eating an axe swing from Tiny, or a mace to the face from Miles. Mechanically, the bats are operating with disadvantage due to the holy light, and the illumination makes it impossible for them to stealth their approach. Individually, they're not terribly tough, so this combination proves a serious deterrent. The stairs end in a passageway, high above the lowest part of the cavern floor. The passage is fairly wide, but quickly dead ends into a fortification. Crude goblin stonework and woodwork builds upon the bones of an old Thalmati structure. A wall spans the length of the passage, and they see a wooden gate, closed. Several large window apertures open along the top, allowing sentries to see and shoot if needed, but no shots are forthcoming. They approach, and they hear muffled arguing from within. Arguing in a goblin tongue, Hubert can only make out one word in ten, but it's enough to know that they are scared. Yorin climbs up the wall to poke his head in one of the apertures and confirms. There are perhaps a score of goblins within, huddled together in what appears to be little more than an outpost or guardhouse, terrified. Hubert opts to really put the fear of God into them. He covertly slices open his arm, lets some blood run down onto the stone, tells Tiny and quickly to break down the gate, and as they begin hammering it with their axes, Hubert quietly begins a Svartic chant. Yorin still hangs from the wall, just below the window that overlooks the gate. A brave goblin climbs up the wall and begins to aim a crossbow out of the window at the attackers below. Yorin pops up, rams his dagger through the goblin's chest, and pulls him out the window. Tiny and Quickly are wounded, battered, and tired, but they are axemen. The goblin-made gate doesn't stand a chance. They hack it enough that it can be broken free of its moorings, and Hubert strides forward as the gate comes down. Hubert is no expert at Valari blood magic, but he studied a great deal after they got Hakon's ritual implements, as his Tier 3, Blood and Salt, can attest. The goblins are already in a heightened state of fear, clearly aware of what has happened down below to their gods. All Hubert has to do is nudge them a little. The Valari fear effect takes root, and the goblins scatter, screaming in terror. The badly worn-out members of Steelshod quickly seize the outpost. It's small, just a handful of crude buildings and simple fortifications on either side, illuminated by a large cook fire and the glowing blue fungus. It appears that the goblins have cultivated the fungus, and they have crude lamps made out of simple wooden cages, enclosing a stone covered in the glowing material. Yorin detaches a couple lamps and passes them around, he also scouts a few buildings and finds some sort of dried meat and mushroom rations, and a couple bladders of fresh water. He doles some out to everyone, as they've been many hours down below without much in the way of supplies. Orson and Elena redress Ben's leg, taking a little extra time to clean the wound with fresh water and bind it up as best they can. They've caught their breath, but the outpost is still far too close to the Thalmati. Besides, while they are stopped, they hear the distant sound of horns echoing through the caves. No doubt an alarm has been raised after what they did. They exit the outpost, arbitrarily picking a tunnel that leads sort of up. Using the luminescent goblin lanterns, Yorin hopes they might pass goblins unmolested if they are sufficiently far away. It kind of works. Of the three patrols they pass over the next few hours, Yorin and Alexander only have to kill one of them. They are gradually going upwards, 
and they come across a wide, swift river that they think might be connected to the one that they were swept down. So they follow it for a time. But even with a bit of food and drink they've had, they are flagging badly. They aren't sure how many hours they've been down here, but if their last legs have last legs, they're on those waiting for that fifth wind to kick in. They tread carefully, on the lookout for enemies and somewhere to rest. Finally, Yorin finds a small offshoot passageway, dimly lit by natural fungus. He explores the narrow entryway, hoping to find a somewhat secluded place to rest. He feels his foot snag, and before his conscious mind processes this is a tripwire, his instincts kick into gear and he leaps backward, ducking as he does. A crossbow bolt thwacks into the stone where he stood moments before. Interesting. Above, on the underpass road, the goblins place all sorts of traps, but he hasn't seen any down here. Whatever's being protected here, he wants to know what it is. So he delves further, searching closely for traps. Avoids a deadfall, and what appears to be a full-on cave-in, he emerges into a dead-end chamber, lightly lit by blue fungus. He looks around, trying to figure out what was worth guarding with traps, when he spots a familiar, utterly flabbergasted face. Yorin? Nate exclaims. Mucker! Yorin says, delighted by this surprise. What the bloody hell are you doing down here? Nate says. And how'd you get past my traps so easy? Yorin just gives Nate a look. The sapper sighs, nods in understanding. After the niceties, Yorin realizes that Nate is badly hurt. It appears he's broken one leg and injured the other. He's got a stick that he uses to hobble around, but he can't move fast or fight. Hence, why he chose to hole up in a dead-end passage and trap the shit out of it. His cavern has a steady drip of what appears to be fresh, clean water, and mushrooms that Nate says he finally ate a bit of to no ill effect. Yorin dismantles the traps and guides everyone into the hiding spot and rearms the traps. They take a longer breather. Orson confirms the mushrooms are safe, so they eat and drink and rest. Orson and Elena once again assess Ben's wounds. In a stroke of genius, they bend one of Yorin's lockpicks into a sharp, curved shape. Along with some thread plucked out of a cloak, they create the world's shittiest needle and thread. As Orson is still one-handed, Elena sutures the worst of the damage to Ben's leg, it isn't pretty, but it's a little better than before. Elena insists on checking Orson's hand as well. It's very bad. He suspects he'll end up losing some fingers, likely a whole hand, but most of the damage is internal, not a lot they can do with their limited supplies. They rig up some splints for Nate, take turns taking watch and getting a couple hours sleep. Sleeping on the cold, hard stone in the alien light of the blue fungus shouldn't be comfortable, but after their recent ordeals, it's heavenly. After everyone's had a few hours sleep, and Orson and Elena believe they are as ready as they'll ever be, they get moving. Nate's a big, heavy-set man. He leans on Miles and Drengy while Quickly and Tiny continue helping Ben. Ben's leg is starting to get hot, and he's feeling feverish. But he keeps a stiff upper lip like a good Cadian yeoman should. Orson has warned him that he might not keep the leg, to which he replies, Lad, I'm a longbowman. Son of a longbowman who was the son of a longbowman. You've seen me shoot. I ain't exactly Kara. Reckon I can hunker down in one spot and set up a good kill zone whether I'm on a peg leg or not. Some chuckles at that. Orson privately warns Alexander and Yorin that if they don't get some access to decent medical equipment soon, it could be a good deal worse than just losing a leg. They understand, of course, and Yorin redoubles his efforts, scouting ahead. Yorin finds a narrow but traversable path that continues to hug the river. They opt to take it, continually traveling against the direction of the current, towards the source. It's the closest thing to a landmark they can find down here. After some more traveling, their path broadens, and they follow the river via a wide, open passageway. It makes Yorin nervous, but he stays on the lookout for danger. Suddenly, they feel the ground rumble beneath them. The stone shakes, and up ahead they hear the sound of shouting. From the sounds of it, a large number of goblin warriors, 
and ogres. Alexander and Huron exchange a look. There are no good side passages to duck into. The only choices are forward and backward. The steel shod commanders ready their weapons and press onward. Thank you for tuning in to Steel Shod, a series by Mostly Rights, narrated by Tailforge. You can find every chapter in text format, as well as character sheets, setting information, maps, and rule documents on the Steel Shod tabletop system in the link below. If you'd like to support the channel, you can pop down to the description and use the Patreon link for recurring donations, the PayPal.me link for one-time donations, the Teespring link for shirts with the incredibly cool background art by nobody, or use the Drive-Thru RPG affiliate link the next time you're looking to try a new system. If you'd like to support the author, you can find Steel Shod merch on the MostlyWrites.com store, or donate to the Mostly Rights Patreon, which are both linked on reddit.com slash r slash mostlywrites down below.